Hello and welcome to another video on Zero Trust Networks. In this video, we will see how the user's trust can be established, validated and used in Zero Trust Networks. For better understanding of this video, I would recommend you to watch the first four videos in the playlist in that order. Let's get started. As we have seen in one of the previous videos, a single user can use multiple devices at his disposal as much as multiple users using a single device for their necessity. This has become increasingly the norm. Conflating user identity with device identity also runs into the problems when we have users with multiple devices. Credentials that need to be copied between several devices have increasing risk of being exposed. Devices might need different credentials based on their capabilities. In network kiosks, we see this problem becomes even more difficult. Zero trust networks identify and trust users separately from devices. Sometimes identifying a user will use the same technology that is used to identify devices. But we must be clear that there are two separate credentials. This chapter will explore what it means to identify a user and store their identity. We have already looked at how devices were trusted in a zero trust network. We will discuss when and how to authenticate users. User trust is often stronger when multiple people are involved. So we will discuss how to create group trust and how to build a culture of security. Informal identity is how groups self-assemble identity. Consider a real world situation where you meet someone based on how they look and act, you can build up an identity for that person, right? When you meet them later, you can reasonably assume that they are the same person based on these physical characteristics. You might even be able to identify them remotely, for example, by hearing their voice, not looking at them. This type of identity has clear weakness when the stakes are higher. One can manufacture a fictitious identity, one can claim identity of another person, one can have several identities, multiple individuals can share a single identity. Authoritative credentials on the other hand are a lot stronger. In the real world, the authority falls to the governments. Government issued IDs like passports, driving license are distributed to individuals to represent their identity to others. For low risk situations, these IDs alone are sufficient to prove of one's identity. However, for high risk situations, cross checking against the government database provides a better guarantee. The same way we do verify against our other identity cards for proving the identity for an ISP. Computer systems need similar mechanisms for a user to regain control of their identity in case of lost or stolen credentials. These systems often require presenting another form of verification, say a recovery or an alternative authentication credential. Just like if you lose a passport, you can still go to the government with your biometrics to prove that you are you and then apply for a passport depending on the credentials that you already have in the other database. Storing and authenticating user identity is one thing, but how do you generate the identity to begin with? It probably comes as no surprise that one of the primary recommendations for accomplishing human authentication is through the use of government issued identification. For instance, when a new user comes into the company, if he is checked against the user inventory, it would fail. Now, a trusted guy like a hiring manager can actually take him to the user inventory by informally identifying the new user. Once the informal identification is done, he goes to the system admin, another trusted source. He could tell him that I have an informal identity of this new user. You can add it into the user inventory. The trusted admin at that point allocates an authoritative credential to the new user which he will write into the user inventory. This way identity is generated and stored in the user inventory. While this would be a strong signal of trust just like anything else in a zero trust network it should not be the only method for authentication. To trust users systems typically need centralized records of those users. One's presence in such a directory is the basis by which all future authentication will occur. Having all this highly sensitive data stored centrally is a challenge which unfortunately cannot be avoided. 
A zero trust network makes use of rich user data to make better authentication decisions. Directories will store traditional information like username, phone numbers, organization role and extended information like user location and public key of a 509 certificate they have issued. Given the sensitive nature of data being stored on users, it is best not to store all the information together in a single database. For example, a system that stores last known location of all users could be used to spy on users. These databases should ideally only be exposed via constrained APIs which limits the use of the information divulged. The act of authenticating a user is essentially the system seeking to validate the user is indeed who they say they are. For example, to log into a subscription music service, you just need a password. But your investment account probably requires a password and an additional code. This is because investing is a sensitive operation. The system must trust that the user is authentic. The music service on the other hand is not as sensitive and chooses not to require an additional code because by doing so it would be a nuisance for the users. Since authentication derives trust, it makes sense to use trust score mechanism that mandates authentication requirements. This means a user should not be asked to further authenticate if the trust score is sufficiently high and conversely the user should be asked to authenticate when the score is too low. While authenticating and authorizing a request, using multiple channels to reach the requester can be very effective. One-time codes provide an additional factor especially when the code generating system is not on a separate device. Push notifications provide a similar capability by using an active connection to a mobile device. There are many applications of this idea and they can take different forms. Depending on use case, one might choose to leverage multiple channels as an integral part of a digital authentication scheme. Leveraging multiple channels is effective not because compromising a channel is hard but because compromising many is hard. Session caching is very common in authenticating credentials but is a no-no in terms of authorization. Frequent validation of client's authorization is critical. This is one of the only mechanisms that allow control plane to effect changes in data plane applications as a result of changes in trust. Now that we know when to authenticate, let's dig into how to authenticate a user. The common wisdom which is also applicable in zero trust networks is that there are three ways to identify a user. Something that they know. What is that the user alone knows? His password? Something they have? A physical credential that the user can provide like a token or a time sensitive token? Something they are? An inherent trait of the user like a fingerprint scan or a retinal scan etc. We can authenticate a user using one or more of these methods. As you would have seen in real life scenarios where you would be presented with multiple options. A password to log into an email address. A two factor authentication in Google Mail which, which gives you an OTP to enter. Validating that you are the right user in an ISP which takes your biometrics. Let's dig deeper into the three areas. Passwords. What are the qualities of a password? To start with, it's long. A recent NIST password standard states a minimum of 8 characters but 20 plus character passwords are common among security conscious individuals. Passphrases are often encouraged to help users to remember a long password. It should be difficult to guess. Users tend to overestimate their ability to pick up truly random passwords. So generating passwords from random number generators can be a good mechanism for choosing a strong password though convenience is effective if it can be easily committed to memory. It should not be reused. Passwords need to be validated against some stored data in a service. When passwords are reused, the confidentiality of that password is only as strong as the weakest storage in use. If you crack the database, you crack the password. Passwords should never be directly stored or logged in databases. Instead, a cryptographic hash of the password should be stored. We look at TOTP. But the using an application or a hardware device, TOTP requires sharing a random secret value between the user and the service. This secret and the current time are passed through a cryptographic hash and then truncated to produce the code that need to be entered. As long as the device and the server roughly agree on the current time, 
a matching code confirms that the user is in possession of the shared key. The storage of the shared key is critical both on the device and on the authentication server. An alternative to TOTP is to send the user's mobile phone to a random code or an encrypted channel like ping ID. What ping ID does is to send a message to our phone to be entered into the application to validate the user's credentials. Certificates. Certificate is derived from a strong private key and then signed using the private key of the organization that provided the certificate. So the certificate can be used as a credential with any service that is configured to trust the signature of the organization. In every organization you get certificates signed by every sign. Security tokens are hardware devices that are used primarily for user authentication. The hardware itself generates a private key. This credential information never leaves the token. The user's device interacts with the hardware's API to perform cryptographic operations on behalf of the user, proving that they are in possession of the hardware. Asserting identity by recognizing physical characteristics of the user is called biometrics. As we all know, fingerprints, handprints, retinal scans, voice analysis and face recognition are common biometrics that, that are in use today. Using biometrics might seem like ideal authentication method. After all, authenticating a user is validating that they are who they say they are. What could be better than measuring physical characteristics of a user? But attacks against fingerprint readers have been demonstrated. Attackers obtain pictures of latent fingerprints and then 3D print a fake one. With this printed fingerprint, a scanner would accept the fake fingerprint. Additionally, biometric credentials cannot be rotated since they are a physical characteristics. I would never change my fingerprints in my lifetime. Out of band authentication purposefully uses a separate communication channel other than the original channel that is used to authenticate that request. For example, a user logging into a website for the first time on a device might receive a phone call to validate the request. By using out of band check, a service is able to raise the difficulty of breaking into that account. Since the attacker would need control of the out of band communication channel as well. Out of band checks can come in many forms. These forms should be chosen based on the desired level of strength needed for each interaction. A passive email can inform users of potentially sensitive actions that have taken place recently. A confirmation can be required before a request is completed. Confirmation could be a simple yes or it could involve entering a TOTP code. A third party could be contacted to confirm the requested action. When used well, out of band authentication can be a useful tool to increase the security of the system. Breaking would be twice as hard. Users want to access different applications or services throughout the day, right? Each of them needs authentication. It is not beneficial for the user to be prompted each time an application or a service needs to be accessed. How are we going to solve this? Single sign-on or SSO. Let's first look at the benefits of SSO. Users need to authenticate with a single service. Authentication material is stored in a dedicated service, which can have more stringent security standards. Security credentials in fewer locations means less risk and ease rotations. Under SSO, users authenticate with a centralized authority after which they will be granted a token of sorts. This token is then used in further communication with secured services. When the service receives a request, it contacts the authentication authority or a secure channel to validate the token provided by the client. This is in contrast to decentralized authentication. A zero trust network employing decentralized authentication will use control plane to push credentials and access policy into the data plane. This empowers the data plane to carry out authentication on its own whenever and wherever necessary while still being backed by the control plane policy. This we have seen in one of the earlier videos. Let's look at group authentication. 
Shamir's secret sharing is a scheme for distributing a single secret among a group of individuals. The algorithm breaks the original secret into n parts which can then be distributed to different people. Depending on how the algorithm was configured when the parts were generated, k parts are needed to recalculate the original secret value. When protecting large amounts of data using Shamir's secret sharing, a symmetric key encryption is usually split and distributed instead of using the algorithm directly on data. This is because the size of the secret that is being split needs to be smaller than some of the data used in the secret sharing algorithm. So what would be the trust signal for users? The first one, historical user activity is a rich source of data for determining the trustworthiness of the user's current actions. Humans tend to have predictable access patterns. Most people will not try to authenticate multiple times a second. They are also unlikely to try to authenticate hundreds of times. These types of access patterns are extremely suspicious and mostly bot driven. These are often mitigated with active methods like captures. Captures are nothing but automated challenges which only a human is able to answer. Or worse, log the account. Traffic can be a good trust signal. List of known bad traffic sources can be another useful signal for trustworthiness of user. Traffic that is originating from these addresses and is attempting to use a particular user's identity can point to a potentially compromised user. You would know which user would send which kind of traffic. Geolocationing can be another useful signal for determining the trust of a user. We can compare the user's current location against a previously visited locations to determine if it is out of the ordinary. As a user's device suddenly appeared in a new location in a time frame that they couldn't reasonably travel. If the user has multiple devices, are they reporting conflicting locations? If you see traffic from one device from India and another device from the US with the same credentials, which means one of them is compromised. Geolocation can be wrong or misleading sometimes, so systems shouldn't weigh too strongly. Sometimes users forget devices at home or geolocation databases may be simply incorrect. That's all for this session. I hope you have gained some knowledge on how the user trust is gained in a zero trust network. In the next session, we would look at trusting the applications. We'll start with trusting the source, I mean the code. We'll also see how build systems are trusted, how to trust instances of applications, how to have a safe and secure execution. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.